Welcome to the Indie Writer Podcast, where we talk all things writing and indie publishing. Today, Becca and I are excited to be talking about romance tropes and cliches with Renee Gendron. Renee is a multi-genre romance author. She is a regular contributor to Amuse Bouche, Review, and a Structural Editor. We're so excited to have you today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Jackie, for having me here. Thank you, Becca. Yeah, so to start off, let's just introduce our listeners to what we're talking about. Both tropes and cliches are literary devices often seen in genre fiction. Could you explain the differences between the two? A trope is something that allows for the plot to occur at a certain level. And it's basically a guidepost for your reader to to give them an indication of what the story will be, what to expect in terms of a beginning, a middle, and more or less a climax or a resolution to the to the to the story whereas a cliche is something that emerges and it becomes a standard shortcut that everybody uses and it becomes tired writing or it becomes something to be expected to the point where it's no longer original it's no longer interesting and in some cases it can become stereotypical and it be harmful either to the character or to the world and often the genre depending on how entrenched a cliche would be uh, what are some benefits to authors for using tropes, since those are the ones that we do want to use. <laughs> well, the benefit of using a trope is that you, me as an extensive plotter, you know which beats to hit. And if you understand the arc of the story of that particular trope, you know how you can insert some originality to make that story very much your story. And if you understand how you can layer different tropes, then you can also create a very unique multi genre story. And so think of tropes as a, a roadmap to tell your story and to understand which pivot points and what kinds of decisions need to be made in order to ensure a fulfilling story for your reader. Could you talk a little more about layering tropes? Layering tropes is basically when you take one or more types of stories and you, you assemble them to make sure that they're aligned. Let's take, for example, romance. So romance is a genre, and within the romance genre, you'll have a quest. Maybe the two love interests need to go on a secret mission in a foreign country. Maybe they need to visit grandma's house and they need to go through a forest, you know. So that's a quest, however big or small. And then within that, along the journey of the quest, they are either enemies to lovers or friends to lovers or one has a secret crush on the other. And it becomes a question of how do you align the moments, the key turning points in a quest to ensure that they stack with the key moments of your romance arc. And if you play it well, I always think of this as a DNA strand where you have the double helix, what goes well in the non-romance arc, and then what goes horribly wrong in the romance arc. And then you've got these moments where it goes very well, they're making great progress on whatever it is they want to do as a non-couple. But in the couple aspect, they're struggling. I like to think of stories in terms of a double helix and a double helix where you have one one arc as it were being the non-romance arc and then one arc being the romance. What goes well in the non-romance arc that kind of bubbles up and then what goes unwell, what, what drives conflict in the romance arc and, and you switch. What goes well with romance then becomes miserable in the non-romance arc. And when you play around with that And you're also creating different kinds of conflict to ensure a more evenly spaced store, paced and placed store. That's interesting. And I imagine, especially in the romance genre, as with other diehard fans of specific genres, that a lot of your readers have certain expectations, too. And so there's probably only so, so far you can push flipping some of these really well-loved tropes on, on their head while also providing your reader with the satisfaction that they're expecting. Well, when romance, for for a story to qualify as romance, it must have a happy for now ending or happily ever after ending. So that expectation absolutely must be met. However, you in your non-romance arc, sometimes they fail miserably. And you just have to live with not being the rock star. You have to live with not realizing all of your dreams. But you can still have a happy for now in your love interest perspective. But if you look at like a thriller, take the romance compartment component out of it, and you're dealing only with like a straight up thriller or sci-fi, you still have expectations for that audience. There are certain expectations of world building. In a thriller scenario, there are expectations of pacing. It has to be a tight time frame. There must be the equivalent of a ticking bomb 
there must be the equivalent of a, a worthy villain for to drive that that thriller main character through that and the stakes need to be real you know in a thriller you're not racing against the stove timer to make sure that your your cake doesn't burn or deflate that's not worthy enough mm -hmm. of a stake for a thriller right so there are expectations in every genre and it's up to the writer to be able to meet and in some cases exceed expectations and if you look at the show 24 that caught the audience completely off guard and it was a new way of looking at structuring a thriller where one actual hour of television was the entire episode do you see a possibility for new tropes to emerge or do you see new tropes emerging there's always going to be new tropes emerging because craft throughout the world emerges. What won't necessarily change are the basic plots of the, the book, right? One of the tropes that have emerged in recent decades in romance, for example, have been polyamorous relationships. That is something that has emerged quite recently that was not present in literature or in romance prior to that. But when you're looking at the basic seven plot types, I think it was Booker who had identified seven types of plots and quests, rags to riches, redemption, tragedy. Those are just basically every story regardless of genre. But when you're looking at tropes, absolutely. And they emerge as tastes and as different forms of relationships emerge in society. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, are there certain tropes that you find yourself drawn to either as a writer or as a reader or both? I am drawn to tropes or stories, I should say, in which there is sincere character development. Every romance has to have character development on the personal level and then on the couple level for that romantic relationship to work. However, the amount of character development varies on author and subgenre. And I don't mind enemies to lovers, but I prefer it when there are deep insights on the part of the characters. And deep insights don't necessarily mean that it is earth shattering and they've discovered the cure for cancer and they you know, they've come up with a 10-step program to deal everybody's personal problems. It doesn't have to be that, but it does need to be some sort of authentic growth on their part. I enjoy a romance in which the characters are beyond characterizations, either just basically they're fleshed out and fully fleshed out as characters. They have their own deep hurts. They have their own needs. They, they learn and adapt as circumstances arise as opposed to being like a static hero or heroine or main character in which their character development happens only in the last 10 pages when it's make or break. I think people learn a little bit at a time. Sometimes they go forward, sometimes they regress, sometimes they have a breakthrough moment and then something happens and they revert back to their old self because they're scared, right? So character development is not necessarily linear. That's not a trope. It's more on how to base the story. Uh, in terms of tropes that I, I enjoy reading, Friends to Lover is nice to see how those dynamics change over time and what's the threshold, what's the difference between being somebody's friend and having a romantic interest in them and the emotions around do we proceed, do we not, why, why not. I think that's interesting to explore. I write a lot and one of the things I do in, in order to hone my craft, and I'm always learning, I am not perfect, I am a work in progress as much as my my drafts and, and work are works in progress. But I keep tables of which stories I write, because I write long series as well, right? And I make it a promise to my reader that if it's within the same series, you will not have the same combination of genre and trope. Oh, okay. Cool. And that way it keeps every book fresh. And I've been writing some novellas and some short stories for Amuse Bush Review, among other places. And again, I will always mix up those tropes, even if they're all based in contemporary setting or a fantasy setting or whatever. I make it a point to mix things up to make sure that I continue mm -hmm. to learn my craft, but also to, to stretch and to see what else I can do in the writing sphere to, to present new content for writers. And I have followed many writers who were extremely successful at writing one or two tropes throughout many books. And I respect their choice. And I admire the fact that they've been able to make careers. I try, for my own personal reasons, to mix things up. Becca's actually writing a romantic comedy novel at the moment. So are there any tropes that you're enjoying playing with as you dive I into like this new genre? Second chance. Yeah, I really like second chance romances. So people who were <laughs> together and then for some reason or another 
we're apart and then find each other <laughs> again. And then I like it because they have to struggle with, like Renee was saying, what didn't work and <laughs> how are we going to make it work? You mentioned friends to lovers, which I also really love. Do you have, do you have any examples of like the perfect friends to lovers book? I might, if you'll bear with me. So as far as second chance romance, my favorite yep. that I've read lately is Starcrossed by Minnie Dark. You were talking about character development, and I just thought it was wonderful. And there were so many things that I would have liked about it, even without the romantic arc. And I thought it was really well done. Can you that give us a quick cool. overview of what that's about, Becca? Because I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, so it's a woman who is a copy editor at a magazine, and by these chance circumstances, she finds herself in charge of editing the horoscopes, and she decides to mess with them to try to get her her past flame to fall back in love with her, and it's just it's very fun. Well, there's a classic romance that's not quite friends to lovers, but given the time, the ro the the male the the male main character is very supportive, very supportive, and is tangential to the story until almost the very end. But if you look at Frederica by Georgia Tyer, right, that goes back a few decades, and it's really her story and her development as she deals with some family arrangements. But again, it's it's more like him being supportive throughout, and there's a realization on his part three quarters away the book or so that there are romantic feelings towards her. And it's it's not high mm -hmm. conflict, not high sexual tension, it's not considered high heat, and it's just a very nice, gentle thing. Um, if you're looking for something else that's like a friend romance, more like colleagues on a professional level, and then the romance becomes quite after. I, I, always, I would put this as, as friends as opposed to enemies to lovers but shades of milk and honey by mary robinette kowal again the romance is secondary to the rest of what's happening in the heroine's life but it emerges for a love of art and that friendship that desires or then becomes part of a romance and then there's another one that i think would be friends to, to lovers and that would be from amberlyn perry you'll link it to it so it's the first book of that series in which she then the heroine has a difficult relationship with the first love interest. An instigating event happens, and she needs to flee with her sister. And then the second fellow is more protector slash friend at the beginning. So that that would be something. So th those are heavy on the historicals. Perhaps that gives away my my interest in in being historical. Could we talk a little bit about some that maybe you intentionally steer clear of because they're not up your alley? Personally, I strive to create healthy relationships, even though my characters have quite deep hurts. In my fantasy romance, for example, the series, the first series is 29 books and it's in development. And there's a lot of deep conversations in a fantasy world. It's a second fantasy world where part of one story is dealing with the death of stillborn children. Another one is dealing with problems of fertility. A few others are dealing with postpartum depression. There's dealing with PTSD issues as, as being soldiers. So these are not light subjects to tackle, but I try to, even in a second world, keep them realistic and believable characters. That said, I tend to shy away from tropes in which there's inherent abuse in that relationship. I personally try very hard to make sure that the characters are real, believable, struggle, and overcome. And I find that tropes in which verbal abuse, sometimes even physical abuse, um, sexual coercion, in which you'll have some of the higher heat romances where one partner simply does not want to engage in certain sexual acts, but are coerced or forced to. I'm not comfortable writing that. It reminds me of another question. I know that there have been some questions on Twitter lately about power dynamics within the Romeo and Juliet kind of story structure and real world oppression. And I'm wondering if there are any tropes you can think of where you have to be really careful to avoid reinforcing negative power, power dynamics, but it can be done. And if so, do you have any advice? Trope or not, whatever, whatever genre you're writing, 
we, we, we live in a world of social relationships and every social relationship has power. And it's a question of what's the intent behind the power. If you are a parent and you have a child, you have power over that child. You simply have responsibilities in some cases to, to impede the child's freedom for their own benefit. Anything from not running into the street, you take their hand away, you know, you grab them by the hand and say, okay, don't do that, um, to perhaps setting up time limits in terms of what you can and cannot do with your friends. There are certain things that are inherent in this prior dynamics that you simply have power over someone and it's beneficial to that relationship. There are other situations in society in which you have power over one person or a group of people in which it causes harm to that relationship. And you need to have an understanding of what harm means and how harm is interpreted because it varies per group. And if you are unsure, the best way to resolve this is to have a robust group of people to do beta reads. And there is also something to be said in which you can write a story in which one relationship has harm. But then you highlight the harm and appropriate corrective actions are taken in order to empower that character to address the harm in a mean. And addressing the harm in a meaningful way sometimes can simply be being assertive. It could be they, they leave the job with the bully boss. It could mean that they deal with the snooty ladies of the community bake-off committee and say, I don't need that drama in my life. So it, it's a question of scale. And it's a question of impact. And then sometimes, depending on the story you want to write, that they start a stronger movement or campaign to address something systemic. Then that has to have a realistic time frame as well, because leaving uh, the baking committee that's just a bunch of snooty ladies is a different kind of consequence and choice than leading a national campaign to reform fill in the blank. And the, the work and the resources and the emotional drain of something of that scale needs to be reflected and respected in the story. Totally. Thank you for I, that. I think that would, all stories have power dynamics and it's a question of how well you or how deep you wish to explore them and to what end. And it's an opportunity to also show different avenues of addressing one particular situation. Thank you. That's very helpful. On a lighter note, are there tropes that you think are overrated or underrated? Do I think some tropes are underrated? I think every trope is underrated because they're fun to write in some cases. <laughs> uh, in some cases. Uh, but let's just take a look. I, I live on TV tropes, and there's a brilliant website called MindyKlasky.com. That's an actual author. And she, um, when I'm looking to create my stories, I spend time understanding tropes and how they fit with whatever I want to say. And I'm going through some of them and dealing with a band of brothers kind of situation is fun when you want to write a series because then each brothers they get their own book right this is how you form your your community uh, around that so that that's something i do quite a lot sometimes fake relationships can lend very well for a rom-com because a lot of hilarity right. can something like that and it's just kind of fun i'm just going through the list here and Law enforcement, I actually just finished a writing a contemporary romance that was based on a, lo a law enforcement trope. That's kind of fun. Opposites attract can also have a lot of sparks and a lot of humor, depending on the kind of thing you want to write. And sometimes in terms of strong character development and very strong moments of insight, a revenge trope can provide mm. that. Do I actually take a person's life or destroy their career or sue them until they're penniless and homeless kind of thing. And that can force a lot of self-reflection if that's the course you choose to take. Sometimes they can be petty too, so you have to be careful on how you write that. And there's a lot of fun and empowerment that can happen if you're, de if you're dealing with an ugly duckling trope. And mm. ugly duckling tropes historically have been her physical looks. However, in contemporary settings with different kinds of power imbalances, you can have an ugly du duckling trope be more than just a person's appearance. And they can be ostracized on some for some other purpose, and then you can have them work their way through and develop their own community and overcome whatever and develop self-esteem. And they, it, it becomes quite an uplifting trope, if, depending how you write it, but that, that's fun. I love that distinction you make because I think it kind of shows how you can take a trope and take it out of the cliche and and make it more modern and more empowering. 
Uh, what about you, Jackie? Are there tropes that you think are underrated in your genres? Uh, well, I now that you're talking about the revenge, I, I'm writing a revenge story right now that's incredibly satisfying to flip on its head and play with. But I, I was just kind of thinking as you were talking, are there ever times when you're writing these tropes and you find that they start to kind of overpower the romance arc? And how do you how do you play with that and kind of retip the scales? Because I could see that if you're say the the band of brothers or anything like that, that it could it could then start to lead your story. So how do you go back and make sure that it still stays in the romance genre? Well, so this is one of the problems I have in my particular writing is that I make it a point to write a book that's 50% romance, 50% non-romance. This is something okay. more or less unique to me because in a, a standard romance novel, it's going to be 85% towards the romance. And then if you're dealing with a standard thriller novel or sci-fi novel if there is a romance component that's going to be maybe 10 or 15 percent of the plot my goal for my writing is to do 50 50 but i'm an extensive plot and that means that i i, I know my povs i know the conflicts i know this, the conflicts per scene i know how that's going to advance the romance and the non-romance arc in that scene as well as in that chapter i do a lot of work to balance out the threads and to stack the scenes so both plots move along simultaneously where possible. And I will also look at word count and literally look on a page, what's the distribution in the book? There are some storylines in which it's not easy for me to always weave romance and non-romance in the same thing, because one character has a job in which the second character cannot do, therefore the first character is going to be alone doing things, you know, um, that's a very technical term, and they're going to be doing things over there that they can't bring the love interest along. But on the whole, how do they call, how do the two characters complement one another? How do they drive personal growth, and how do they drive the relationship growth? And uh, to your point, how do I how do I make sure that things are are balanced between them? It's being very conscious of the word count, how I play around with the tropes to not make to not have one overpower. How do I make that trope interesting? How do I layer more conflict and add more tension to that scene to make it more unique? And how do I make sure that the characters are strong enough to deal with that trope? If mm -hmm. the trope is overpowering the story, it's because the characters aren't fully flushed, flushed out. Okay. And once they aren't adequately developed, I need to add more skills, more quirks, more problems, more obstacles, more character growth. Sometimes I need comic relief from a secondary character to make sure that it brings back the story to the, the character realm uh, so there are different ways of, of making sure that the story isn't the trope the story is the cure Vinny, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your actual plotting process since you're such an extensive plotter do you lay index cards out do you make a visual map do you use word or how do you do you start with an outline how do you plot so I, i'm going to show this to you because i can't show it to the podcast i do apologize however every now and then i do repost a picture i have an entire closet full of notebooks of a particular series i don't like any notebooks i had to be those notebooks and i there there's five or six different copies like different styles on the, the the front page of the notebooks and i have over 200 of them in my closet so it must be wow. in these notebooks it, it just must usually if i'm dealing with a series for example i will start off with the world i need to understand what the parameters of the world are and what's going to drive the conflict throughout the entire series. Once I have that, I then drill down to each book. And I don't know how many books will be in the series until I'm done. I will point form it out. One of the series I'm developing is a alternative history historical romance. And what I did is I is once I have the arc for the world, what do I want to accomplish with the world? What's what's a big enough catastrophe of a conflict that stakes to drive this i then look at tropes and i go what would book one look like and then when i have book one i will then um say okay i look at my my man mindy klasky tropes i look at tvtropes.com all right so alternative history and then revenge and then what's the the other job that i'm going to be right it's going to be a mystery it's going to be a thriller it's if it's revenge it's probably going to be a thriller kind of plot 
Then I break it down and it comes into something like a half um, page. It's my handwriting. It's as good as it gets. And I, I just break that down until I have something for the entire series that, that's unique. When I have this done, I put it into a table on Word. I'm not, I just keep things simple. I put the name of the characters. I put which book it is, which um, sub, well, which non-romance arc it is, mystery, thriller, sci-fi, whatever it is. And then I put the romance trope. And what do I want to accomplish in book one? Mm -hmm. And I, I do that for the entire series. And that way I can look at it from a bird's eye view and make sure that I keep my promise to my readers. Always have original combinations of tropes. And in this case, because mm -hmm. this book, series, the Alternative History series, is five factions in 86 books, I put sticky notes. And so wow. this, I wanted to make sure the balance between the factions is equal. So whatever, like, you know, orange is one faction, purple is another faction. Yeah, I take this seriously. Like, like I take wow. This how long are your books? Can I, can I ask that? How long are your books on average? Well, the contemporary romance that's going to be coming out in fall 2021, that right now is out to beta readers, and it's 96,000 words. Heartened by Crime, wow. which came out in November 2020, is a collection of novellas and short stories. That comes in at 60,000. Jaded mm -hmm. Hearts is a historical western that comes out in fall 2021. That's going to trend at 60,000. The fantasy romances will probably okay. be edited 85. So it just varies a bit. Anyway, so to, to, you wanted to know about my plotting process. Now I have a bird's eye view of the table, right? The, the book, the characters, the romance, the non-romance tropes. And then I make sure that those things are original. And in the case of this one, because I have five different factions, I want to make sure that the balance between factions is equal as well. So faction one mm -hmm. has two interactions with faction two and then I, I i work it through that way as well to make sure that there's a, there's a harmony and a balance between them. then i write the thing then i do a full outline i should say and a full outline is thanks for sharing pages point form <laughs> and then with the full outline i'll i'll, I'll base it on um, the book but yeah so that's a little bit about my process I don't go as thorough for the short stories and novellas that I write. For the, the novellas that I write, I take it in one of these series of notebooks in my house, and I uh, I, I basically just do the, the the plot beats for the tropes and line them up. And I'm going to show it for your benefit on the camera, but I will have I will have two columns: one for love interest one one for love by interest two. And then these are the things that need to happen for her. These are the things that need to happen for him. And those are all non-romance beats. And once I understand the trope, I'll go back and then I'll say, okay, this is how I compare the non-romance art and stack it with the romance beat and just two columns. And then that's the story. And it zigzags. And usually it fits. Sometimes there were a couple of stories and the fantasy uh, romance in the second series of the fantasies that I, I couldn't, the beats didn't align well and the stories weren't going well. So that was a learning exercise. And I went back and picked everything apart and I figured out how I can make the tension and the stakes work. And usually it's because there's not enough conflict on the page in order for those things to work. Or the conflict had been rehashed to the point where I couldn't figure out of a new problem to throw at the character for them to kind of like problem, obstacle, problem, obstacle kind of thing. That's amazing. I'm just in awe as a pantser <laughs> of your process. Thank you for sharing it. That's all, that's cool. I think a lot of our listeners will really be inspired by how organized you are. That's so neat. And I'm so glad we had you on. I, we were talking earlier about how we found you and it seems like you are the one to have on for our, our tropes episode because that's kind of <laughs> yeah. the building blocks of, of your process. So yay. How are we doing on questions, some, Becca? Should we uh, switch to good, some yeah. audience Q&A? Yeah, let's do okay. it. You can ask the first one. Sure. Let me pull it up real quick. All right. So um, this question, and I believe you actually chatted a bit on Twitter, but we'll talk about it more in depth here, is from Twitter user Joan Wendlin. 
at BNC Games on Twitter. She asks, is the you will inherit a ton, but you must cohabit with someone you hate trope dead yet? And if not, why? <laughs> so it sounds like that's one that she does not enjoy. Um, and it sounds like that's kind of, I guess, what they're getting at is kind of a take on that forced close proximity that you, you mentioned. And so what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, most tropes don't die. They just tend to go away for a little while. Uh, <laughs> romance in particular has... Uh, it's quite sensitive to market trends, and a lot of the publishers will, when when a trend hits, they'll then contact their stable of writers and say, who can give me this trope within a, a month kind of thing, and that's really the charm of, of romance. But the forced pro proximity tropes are popular because people get stuck, right? And you, you, you force people in a snowstorm, or you force people to, if you want money, then you have to do something. A really good forced prox proximity book, and I know this one off the top of my head because I fell in love with it, uh, is Lady Pirate by Lindsay Sand. And uh, if the woman wants to inherit, she has to marry, and then he also has his own issues, and so they're, they're forced to figure out if a relationship can work, and there's a lot of personality differences and background differences that makes it quite interesting. Uh, what, makes, what makes it appealing to, I think, is we talked about power dynamics. It does appeal to certain types of power dynamics within the within the relationship. And sometimes it's interesting to explore those. And sometimes it can verge on what I would consider some of the more abusive aspects of a romantic relationship. But people like to read it. And it, it stays out there whether or not a particular reader is interested. There's enough traction in the market. And it might also lend well to a particular subgenre of romance. Like the one I mentioned by Lindsay Sands, for example, that's a historical romance. And you'll have different gender roles and expectations and requirements in, let's say, inheritance, for example, to marry, which tends to lead more towards a historical social constraint, societal expectations. Whereas if that was contemporary, Canada, 2021, COVID or not, a lot of people would go, that's unusual, to ha extremely unusual to have that in a an inheritance package today. So that maybe there's also that aspect where it lends very well to regencies. And regencies are still very popular. I consume them very much. Uh, uh, they're fantastic in my opinion. But again, it's a subgenre within romance that, that would then I wonder if we're going to see an increase in close proximity romances about quarantine. I just. <laughs> it's possible. And it's possible too. Like there are actual statistics out there where in Canada, anyways, um, the, the quarantine is doing one of two things. It's driving married couple or longstanding relationship couples apart uh, because, you know, 24 seven over 365 days, it's driving me bonkers when we used to have a, a separate social life or what have you. But on the flip side, it's actually forcing some couples to take moments to examine the relationship and say, well, you know, we're going to stick this out. How do we actually emerge from this as a stronger relationship? There's two kind of pivots you can do with that, that trope. And it is quite interesting because now with the COVID aspect and the forced proximity, there's also a whole other layer that you can stack onto that. And that's the medical uh, thrillers, medical romances, which are still quite strong. And it adds an extra layer of stakes. Like, if, 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 for example, if you're dealing with a hospital trope romance setting and it's COVID, it's a perfect setting for drama and for high stakes and for fatigue. And it, everybody knows that when you are exhausted, your your tempers flare, or you know, a lot of problems come to the surface and hit you all at once. And those kind of pressure cooker scenarios in a pandemic can be quite interesting to explore. Right. And I'm yeah. sure it could even expand that audience because there's going to be so many people that are relating to all of those feelings right now that maybe wouldn't have before. That's neat. What were you going to say, Becca? Go ahead. And to, I'm thinking more about you or what you just said and people who are looking for the escape of romance novels. So something that they can relate to in one way, but also kind of enjoy as entertainment. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see how that plays out. So we have one more question from yes. Jay, who is Ink and Syrup on Instagram, and she wants to know, 
how do archetype archetypes play into tropes and would they do the same for cliches? There's a difference between archetypes and stereotypes. Archetypes, um, I think there are 12 or 13 of them, and that's basically your character who is the healer, who is the leader, who is um, the, the trickster. These are personality traits or dominant trait skill sets of a person. Somebody's just latent ability to do something or their interest and hobby in doing something. Whereas you've got stereotypes, and let's just go with Canada because I'm Canadian and I'm French Canadian. And the stereotype is that we are all lumberjacks, right? And depending on how you work that out, sometimes it's beneficial to have the, the lumberjack uh, stereotype. Sometimes it's harmful to a person or a community or a group of people to always be pigeonholed as lumberjacks. So it depends, right? So you, if you're dealing with your archetype characters where you've got your healer, you've got your hero, heroine, you've got your... Uh, soldier or soldier type character fighter warrior whatever time frame they are roman centurion fighter right warrior. that can be beneficial and it can help flesh out the character because then it gives you an idea of the of realistic conflicts and nuances for that character what becomes harmful is that they always act in the same way that if you're dealing for example with a soldier that they can't think independently that they have, they might, like, there's no contrast between the orders they receive and their inter- internal dialogue. Even if you disagree with an order, most soldiers will have at least a moment to say, this is really dangerous or this is really stupid. However, with the constraints of my position, I can't object without being punished or court martialed or whatever the case might be. And that's where it becomes dangerous as a stereotype versus archetype. And a stereotype, for example, I've got one short story in which one fellow was on a lot of sports teams and he ended up being an actuary who actually makes twice the amount of money that the main character makes. Now this is the stereotypical jock, broad shoulders, you know, every woman wants him, but he does a very intellectual job. And so you make him much more of a person when you add those nuances. I could give him a, like a bobblehead jock stereotypical job but that that doesn't help the story and it, it's not engaging for the reading for the reader pardon me and in some ways it can be harmful for people who enjoy sports and who have this is not the right word to use but who have uh, vocations or professions that are that that require significant training on an ability and talent on their part to to, to, to do right? when you're looking at a stereotype this comes back to the power dynamics and again what was considered an abuse of power and what can be harmful and if you're not taking the time to explore those power dynamics it can disengage and harm your readers and your your readership i want to make sure that i answer the entire question could you please read it again how do archetypes play into tropes and would they do the same for cliches okay so archetypes playing into tropes again it's making sure you understand the plot beats of that trope. If you're dealing with a revenge scenario, you have to understand which archetype is most likely to go into a revenge. The obvious choice is something hero or soldier, warrior, whatever, but there are other kinds of revenge. And if you have a character, let's say who's a healer, that creates very interesting conflicts for that person because They either are more disposed to help and heal people, perhaps they took a professional oath to do do no harm, but they're out to do revenge. And what's their primary skill set? Healing or medical training of some sort. What happens if they intentionally give them the wrong medication? What happens if they deny them medication? What happens if they intentionally botch a treatment or surgery and then they die on the table? There's a different character arc that can happen there and a different kind of morality to be explored and ethics to be explored. When you're, lo- when you're playing for archetypes into a trope, really understand the different levels of clashes of the archetypes. If you basically look up character archetypes on, on an internet browser, they'll come up with lists. And in those lists, you can understand the strengths and the weaknesses of that particular character archetype and how that would play in a particular revenge plot in that particular setting if it's if you're dealing with a, a historical the chances of being caught are different than if you're dealing with a sci-fi setting where you have 
enhanced medical treatment and medical forensics and other kind of things. And so the stakes are different. The mechanisms for revenge are different. And then the consequences on, let's say, your soldier who has received training to kill in a different setting versus, let's say, the healer who has received training to cure and heal. And again, it's exploring that those, those internal dynamics that will make or break that trope. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Becca. Very informative. Thank uh, you so why much. don't you tell? <laughs> of course, we're so happy you were here. Why don't you tell our listeners about what you're working on next and where to find you? Okay, uh, the best way to reach out to me is on Twitter, Renee Gendron, and then you can those. It'll be spelled below the notes. That's great. Um, but I'm also on Instagram and Facebook under Renee Gendron author as an author page. The I'm I'm most present on Twitter where we have a lot of writing related conversations. I do have a blog called B Plot that people can look at. And I also have a monthly newsletter where I have excerpts of my writing. I have guest authors and I also have writing advice for myself and from the guest author. So that's a bit of both for readers and also writers. What's coming up is I do have my contemporary romance. It's James and Mirabel's story. That's going to be coming out in fall 2021. I don't have the name of the story. Of all the plotting I do, the very last <laughs> thing I write is the actual title of the story. I usually do it by just the names of the characters. And then once it's fully edited and good to go and I actually have to come up with a book cover, then I come up with the name. <laughs> and it's the, the I love that. That's just how it works. And... Okay, the contemporary romance comes out in the fall 2021. I don't yet have a release date, but that's coming. Jaded Hearts will come out in fall 2021. That's a Western historical romance. And July 1st, I believe, there will be an anthology in which I co-wrote a short story with another author. That is coming out July of 2021. And I'm also writing at least three novellas of romantic sports stories and i have the first novella fully plotted i'm going to crank that out hopefully next week it'll be at about twenty thousand words and that will be released wow. in fall <laughs> as well that, so inspiring that, so that that's that's coming up and if i'm if i time it right i might be able to get two other sports i thought uh, not anthologies but sports uh, ro- romantic sports out in in um Fall, early to fall 2021, January 2022. Thank you again. This was really wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to, to talk. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Indie Writer Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will subscribe to hear our future episodes. We want to thank the Writing Block community for the continued support. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or at writingblock.com. No K. Remember to subscribe, share, and tell your friends. Thanks, everyone, and happy writing.